everyone. This is David Brenna with dryflyfishingpro.com. And I'm excited today to do with a podcast. And I want to welcome our guest. Uh, Gary Lewis is a pretty famous author of outdoor uh, books that are both about hunting and about fishing. Uh, I was fortunate to uh, first get to know Gary a number of years ago. He helped do some editing work on my memoirs. Uh, and I thought it would be fun to have him be our first victim <laughs> on yeah. a podcast. And so um, uh, let's just get started. Gary, thank you for joining us. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So um, you, you, I am interested in the hunting side of your story, um, but probably more so the fishing side of your story, given, given my predilection. Um, uh, tell me about how your career came about. Was this something that you'd wanted to do your whole life? Or you know, what, what was that moment when you decided, I'm going to write books and talk about hunting and fishing? Well, the moment was really um, on the bank of a little creek in um, outside of Kalama, Washington. And my mom brought me down to the creek. The creek was called Cedar Creek. And we sat on the culvert next to the road. And, and she was reading me a, a, a book. And I said, stop. Wait where does this come from? And she says, well, what? And I said, the book, the story, you know, all these pictures. And she says, well, there's a whole bunch of people involved in making a book. And so she explained the, who, you know, people write it, people illustrate it, then there's a publisher. And she walked me through that in the words that a four-year-old could understand or a three-year-old. And I said, I want to do that. Wow. Okay. So that was that moment. And later on, I became a fisherman. And so now I'm on the bank of another little Creek on a Sunday and I am not fishing. I am looking at the water and contemplating whether I should become a fly fisherman or remain a gear fisherman. And this was important stuff for me to figure out. I was 12 or maybe 11. And a white moth touched down on the water and bounced around a little bit on the water, like they do sometimes on a summer day. And uh -huh. I said a little prayer. I said, God, if you want me to be a fly fisherman, let's send a trout to eat that fly. And a trout came up and gobbled that fly. <laughs> and I stood up and thanked the Lord. And I got my grandpa to drive me up to a store and I bought a, a eight and a half foot, seven weight uh, fiberglass rod. That was probably... 1979 and that was a standard in those days uh, oh yeah i remember uh eight and a half foot fiberglass rods in in the seven weight um mm -hmm. that seems huge now but that was a standard trout rod so i went i lost that one later but i went and i bought an or i got another one that ended up being you know kind of comparable though not as high quality as the one that I had but it was comparable for that time of my life and my granddaughter uses it now and it's oh, a wow. seven weight Wright and McGill uh -huh. and it would have been state of the art in the 1970s and and she uses it today and she's nine years old and people say well isn't that too heavy and I I think, well, it wasn't too heavy in 1980. <laughs> <laughs> are we weaker now? Well, some of us are. <laughs> well, I have um, a wife and two children that are also avid 
five fishermen. Um, so I know the joys of, of having it happen within your family. Um, when was the first uh, time that you decided to write a book about your experiences? I decided in 92, I, w I went back to my, um, my roots. You know how life kind of beats you down and people tell you you can't achieve your goals? Uh-huh. Well, I know, what, know that well. <laughs> so that's a real thing. And people in your family will tell you you can't do what you want to do. And your friends will tell you you can't do what you want to do because they don't, something in them doesn't want you to succeed. And it's kind of a weird thing about the human condition. And so I decided I was going to become a writer and I was going to make a living as a writer. And that was 1992. And it was not until 1999 that I published my first book. But I, in the meantime, I had become a writer of magazine articles and newspaper articles. And so I think that's the best place for a person to hone their craft is in the short form uh, until they actually have something that other people want to hear or can benefit <laughs> from, you know, and we start out as writers and, and we may not be expert in what we are writing about, but hopefully by the time we finish the project, we are. Sure. Sure. Well, and, and um, as you know, from working with me in the past, I, um, I, it was made very clear to me by my father that you shouldn't do the thing that you love as your occupation. And it was probably the worst advice that I've ever yeah. gotten. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but uh, now I'm, I'm really realizing uh, being able to implement a dream uh, yeah. So I completely relate to what you're saying. Yeah. So um, I, I'm curious about, uh, and I don't want to ask you anything about specific rivers or streams or anything like that, but you said something to me the other day that I, that I found really, really insightful. And that is the, your favorite place to go is the one that you're going to tomorrow and, uh, or next week or, or whenever. And I, I thought that was great. I used to have home waters and I think that's really important as you are becoming the fly fisherman, but eventually for me, it, it became about uh, a specialized form of uh, a discipline for travel. I love going new places and, and eating the foods, meeting the people seeing the rivers and getting to know you know a river or a lake and i get all excited about that and it's also the quest of adding a new species that is also a big part of it for me so i am all about what i'm going to do next and and uh tonight i'm this evening i'm going to go fish for brown trout awesome and then next week we're going to fish with, I'm going to fish with some old friends. Really looking forward to that. And then the week after it's to Alaska for a week. It's uh, some waters you probably fished before. <coughs> so, so tell me how you discover the waters. Do you hear it from other folks that you're fishing with? And they say, oh, I love this stream over here or... Uh, do you just, in the beginning in particular, did you just climb into a car and say, I'm going to drive over to this river because I, I know where it is. I've driven over the bridge. Um, so for, for a long time, it was the Kalama River. It was the North Fork Lewis. And then it was the Clackamas and the Sandy and a little creek called Eagle Creek. And, and as I got to know rivers then i wanted to get to know other rivers and then it was the deschutes and the deschutes became this big Great river. um this big river that i had to relearn fishing on you know i i came to it thinking i was a pretty good fisherman and when i when i found it then it uh proved to me that i didn't know very much 
So then I, I had to start over with a different type of uh, attitude. And do you take your inspiration from other anglers or people who have written about a particular stream or a method? <laughs> yeah, I, I really love the tradition of the sport. So I think it's, it was foundational for me to read Isaac Walton uh -huh. and then to read a lot of the other classics when I was 13, 14, 15 years old. And that was really the period of time that was foundational for me. And I was reading all of that. And then as soon as I was 15, 16, 17, it was Hot Rod magazines. <laughs> and a little, de uh, a little deviation. Yeah, I, it was a deviation that lasted about five years where I, fun. I fishing was something I, I did a, still a lot of, but I didn't journal it during that time. Was, uh, but I returned to journaling. And I think that's a very important thing. And so I can pick up a journal and look at something from 1981 or 1993 and, and remember that day. You know, the Kalama and the North Fork of the Lewis, which you mentioned, are two of my favorite streams. Although the <laughs> yeah. Kalama has kind of declined here recently. It's been very yeah. frustrating. But um, uh, you, you have fished and written about it in other places, most notably maybe Idaho mm -hmm. and Oregon. Idaho, um, I love fish in Idaho and Wyoming. And uh, um, then we went to Utah to complete the, the cutthroat slam. Okay. And so again, those are quests and I love that whole thing about I've got to catch this subspecies from this watershed and then I got to jump over here into this watershed and catch this subspecies so you end up covering a lot of miles uh -huh. and then you have a few special trout that you've you caught and cataloged and let go and i I remember this one place in Utah, I just got down on my knees um, at the base of this plunge pool and I caught four species in that one pool. Wow. <laughs> and I, I thought, wow. And it, this is a tiny <laughs> little river. You know, it, they call them rivers there where we would call them creeks uh -huh. out west and a, a grayling, a brook trout a cutthroat and a rainbow. Huh, wow. All from the same pool that was no bigger than um, my, uh, my office, <laughs> my little tiny office where I write my stories. One of the things that I discovered when I was writing um, articles and, and my memoirs um, was that uh, certain memories of particular fish jumped out at me. Uh, briefly, I was on the Blue River in Colorado and there was a huge rainbow uh, surface feeding on midges with his dorsal fin out of the water. And I pursued that fish for over an hour, changing flies and trying to get him to respond to my offering. He finally did, and I was so excited that I set the hook like I was into some kind of sailfish or something. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, it snapped off immediately. But uh, do, do you have favorite memories of, of different fish? Yeah, I sure do. Um, I remember being 14 years old and sneaking up to the base of a little dam on this creek that was my home water and and i could see this trout that was 21 24 something wow. like that up at the head of the pool and it was staged like it was going to eat a grasshopper floating down to us i figured okay well i've got one shot at this fish so i'm i went in on my belly at first i looked at it 
without a rod and I had to go all the way home, get the rod and come back. And I go in on my belly, I make a cast and you know how a fish has trouble with its depth perception in shallow water when it's close to the surface? Yeah, well, it's, well, this, it's, its window is real tiny. Yeah, so that was my first experiencing uh, time experiencing that and this fish missed the fly by oh. by maybe three inches oh. and I don't remember I don't think I set the hook but I waited for the fly to drift out of its a zone uh -huh. and the fish you know you read their body language and the fish was a little bit flustered and it popped in underneath some low overhanging brush and and I just let my heart rate come back down and I, <laughs> you know, waited five minutes and then I made the cast again and got him oh, that excellent. time. And he, he ran all over the pool and went under a log and stuck that fly in a log. Huh. <laughs> there was no way. Um, I eventually, I landed that fish another day. Oh, that's nice. That's but nice. that was the, that was the first time I tangled with him. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I, it's funny being an instructor. Um, I, I talk to a lot of beginners and what comes up a lot is uh, the size of the fish and the numbers of the fish. And I try to impress upon them that um, the, the thrill of being in the water <laughs> and pursuing trout um, is its own reward. You don't have to catch a bunch of fish or big ones to, to have a wonderful day. And in fact, if you come off the river and you feel like you didn't have a good day, maybe you, maybe you shouldn't be a fly fisherman, you know? Or you should back off and re-examine your motives and, and uh, not, maybe not drink that second cup of coffee. <laughs> Sometimes that's what does it for me. I come at it with the wrong attitude on on a given day and that can be influenced by you know other factors in my life but you know i like to fish this one particular river during the super bowl okay and so i have never been a football fan until i realized that the when the seattle seahawks played i have the river more likely to myself uh -huh. so if the seattle seahawks make the super bowl wow what a great time that is for me because i have the river all to myself <laughs> <laughs> and on i'm those... afraid i won't even be there <laughs> <laughs> and on those days of course that's going to be february and it's going to be cold and if i get a fish it's probably a good fish and one is all I needed, you Absolutely. know, for that day. And so last Super Bowl, I got a nice 18 and a half inch rainbow and landed it because I had brought my big net with the long handle and was able to reach out, you know, and, and scoop it up and then bring it in close and release it. Do you tie flies? I've been tying flies since I was 12. Oh, okay. And someone asked me recently if I was, if I'd ever been an instructor. And I thought, oh, well, yeah, I was. Because I introduced fly tying to our school. Okay. And so I only did that because I wanted to do it in shop class. <laughs> and they made me an instructor, you know, a, I thought, well, wait a minute. I'm, I'm not a teacher. <laughs> I'm a student, <laughs> but they made me an instructor. And I'm guessing you're a really good teacher, Gary. I think, I think you have a way to communicate that's excellent, and and so people would listen. Well, thank you. the 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 thing I like to teach, if I'm going to teach anything, as I like to teach rifle shooting and fly fishing. Okay. I don't really want to teach much else. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Talk to me a little bit about your uh, passion for firearms. Do you, uh, do you collect as well as uh, hunt? It becomes a, uh, it becomes collecting. 
And so, yeah. And, but I don't really want to have a big collection because it's, it be, also becomes materialism. It's kind of like with fly rods. If I have a fly rod in my collection that I'm not using, I want somebody else to have it. Sure. And I, I gave away a half a dozen fly rods last year, and I'm going to give away another one next week. And I'll, I'll, I will get more and I will give away more. And very nice. It, I give them to the kids mm -hmm. and you know, they may not be the best fly rod, but it, they'll be functional and they'll have uh -huh. a good line and a, and a decent reel, you know, and a reel is just a collection line sure. collection. Sure. <laughs> if sure. you're trout fishing, you know, if you're steelhead <laughs> fishing, it's a different thing. You need a good reel. <laughs> so um, uh, what game fish are you going to be pursuing in Alaska? Well, it's September. So that means coho and rainbows. Okay. Yeah. And so I wanted to get your opinion because you're such a, a dry fly aficionado. If, if it's September and you're fishing near Soldatna, do you have a dry fly on? Um, I, I confess that I tend to use streamers more often when I'm in Alaska. Mm -hmm. um, I've had some very fortunate experiences. I caught a rainbow um, on the Russian River um in late august on a dry fly that oh, was nice. that was a, a a big surprise i just had to try it um, yeah but uh th that's one of the reasons why um uh, grayling in denali park are so much fun because they're more than happy to come to a dry fly um they're huge compared to most grayling that you yeah. catch and they're numerous um so I, I know I'm contradicting myself a little bit because I'm, <laughs> I love catching so many and so big, <laughs> but, um, but grayling is a, is a, is a great uh, sport fish. It's really a lot of fun. Okay. So to, to, to talk about grayling, I really wanted to catch a grayling. And so when I went to Yellowstone, I researched Yellowstone. I found the place where a person could catch a grayling in Yellowstone and I hiked in there with my family and getting my little flock of children in there and my wife all, all together at the end of a six mile hike was, we got there at noon, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I made the longest cast I could to a rising fish, missed the, the strike, missed a couple of other strikes, didn't hook a fish and then had to walk back out without my grayling. So then as I'm going home from Yellowstone, I'm planning what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Alaska, I'm going to go to Fairbanks, and I'm going to catch grayling. And boy, did we ever. My dad went Excellent. with me. And that was the whole goal of that trip was to catch a grayling. And I, you know, you spend a lot of money on a trip like that. But yeah, it was important all my life. I had wanted to catch a grayling. And, and did we ever do it? Well, I'll give you a pro tip on grailing, and you might notice this next time you have an opportunity to, to fish for them. Two they have a very now. odd uh, behavior in that um, they will literally run into the fly and not take it. They'll they'll reject it at the at the last moment possible, and you'll of course see the splash and the rise. You'll see the fish, and then you lift your rod, and there's nothing there. So um, uh, it took me a long time to figure out that they, they just are really good at changing their minds in the final moments. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And of course, they also uh, can go absolutely nuts and, yeah. and swallow everything you put in front of them. But they're a very fascinating creature. Yeah. I, um, we talk about special fish and special moments. The Mackenzie River is a, a real delight for me these days and i have had trout come out of the water to chase my fly above the surface oh yeah and it's it's one of the only places where that's happened for me and you to where to the point where you tease the fish you know it might be an hour till 
it's dark and the fish are actively feeding it and you can tease them up out of the water to to strike at your fly six or eight inches above the surface it is really fun my wife and i travel to a river in uh north central idaho that uh, i won't name um and when the october caddis hatch and it's really a fall because they've already Mm -hmm. you know they, they hatched the way they do but now they're returning to the river to lay eggs um and the fish are jumping out after the naturals all the time and it one of the funnest things in the world is to have a a good fly matching the october caddis and you're casting and the fly's about to land on the water and a trout comes up and takes yeah. it out of midair it's just yes. amazing yeah 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 <laughs> Now, you mentioned the other day um, the mouse migration that you yes. got yes. into. Would you talk about that a little bit? Oh, sure. Um, there was a forest fire in Alaska uh, near to my uh, son's cabin on Willow. And um, the forest fire kind of came up within about a half a mile of, his, of the river and his uh, cabin. Um, and then fortunately, uh, everything was fine. But for a few weeks after that, mice uh, from the forest fire were leaving the area, obviously. They were migrating to safer places. And, and that included having to um, uh, swim across Willow, Willow Creek. Wow. Okay. And uh, it, it was the first time that I'd ever hit it. I, I tried to um, uh, do another um, set of patterns for trout on the top in Alaska, but uh, it, it, it's tough to catch trout on the top um, in Alaska. Mm -hmm. uh, but that particular uh, trip, we I fished, for, I think it was four days, and I could barely um keep a good um uh mouse pattern on because they got <laughs> so chewed up wow. and they would just come charging from below uh, wherever they were holding out and and surprised me every single time because it's yeah. such a thrill and talk about hard strikes i mean i didn't have to set the hook at all it was more like catching a steelhead on a yeah. waking muddler minnow yes um yeah. and and just fish after fish after fish just had a blast one of the most um special uh trips i've ever had so those fish must have just really started keying on mice and they must have got big bellies too they didn't at the time because they had had a hard winter and the mm. salmon runs were were slow in coming that year yeah. Yeah. Uh, so they were long, so they were big fish, but they were skinny. Oh, um, okay. And uh, th that's what's one of the things about rainbows in uh, Alaska that's so fascinating is that they're very migratory. Yeah. Um, they'll swim back into the river that they overwinter in and up and down yep. and into smaller creeks to feed heavily, and they'll obviously chase salmon. Uh, this is just one of those years where there wasn't a whole lot of salmon eggs. The fish were should have been uh, fat by that time, but they weren't. I'm sure that a couple of weeks later they were fat because, yeah. boy, were they eating a lot of mice. <laughs> wow, yeah, well, that must be really special to experience something like that. It is. It is. Well, and and, and it's part and parcel to fly fishing, as far as I'm concerned. It's like that's why you go is yeah. to have those moments. You may never have them again, but you had them that time and with, with my experience with fishing mouse patterns the fish will charge at it and miss it many times and come back around and they're just mad they missed it <laughs> and then they'll just really wail on it <laughs> that's that's right they'll and do you that. gotta you gotta keep that that mouse moving too so it looks like a mouse Right, right. Acts like although, mouse, although yeah. the funnest takes that I had was when my mouse pattern hit the water and just like a total dry fly, they would mm -hmm. come up and suck it in. Yes. Even before you started swimming yes. it, you're right. Most of the time you get it to swim along and wake and that's when they'll, they'll take it. But um, 
uh, it, it, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Man, so, I got to bring some mouse patterns with me on this trip. Oh, they're easy to tie. Yeah, I've got. <laughs> you don't have to do the box. fancy ones that, that you buy. You, you know, just wrap a bunch of deer hair and yeah. trim it. You're you're in. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe a little uh, leather of tail. tail. <laughs> yeah. So so our time is about up. I want to give you a moment. Uh, talk about your latest book. Okay. Well, the one I'd really like people to know about right now is the Fishing Central Oregon book, and it's in its sixth edition. Wow. And I was not the original publisher, but I became associated with the publisher through different projects. And then I bought that title from him and when he retired. Oh, cool. And so then I've kept it going. His name was Jeff Hill. His name is Jeff Hill. And I um, you know, valued the time working with him on that project and then also being with him when he caught his first steelhead on a fly rod. He'd caught lots of steelhead, but he'd never caught one on a fly rod uh -huh. until, until we made that happen on the Umpqua River one day. And um, so, yeah, it's the Fishing Central Oregon book, and it, and it covers 200 lakes and streams in the region. And what's really fun is we have more <laughs> that aren't in the book. I, and, I, I know. <laughs> I love yeah, to it, fish Oregon. I don't get to do it very often, but yeah. We have more water than a person could fish in four lifetimes. I, I, I believe that. I believe and that. And so I'm, I'm doing my best, you know, to, <laughs> to fish as much of that water as I can. And we have, of course, I have a co-author on the book too, and, and uh, Brooke Snavely is his name. So he fished a, a lot of these waters as well. And then that book is available on my website, GaryLewisOutdoors.com, and is available on Amazon and, and in fly fishing stores and some grocery stores around here. And then we also have coffee and we have the Frontier Roast Coffee oh, and the Fishing Central... And then the Fishing Central Oregon Reserve Roast. Huh. And that's the one I've been drinking the most lately. It's a dark <laughs> roast and I have it every morning. My wife does a real good job of, of making it for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so my wife and I it. are kind of coffee nuts as well. So yeah. well, you'll nothing like this like a, one. Uh, nothing like a cup of hot coffee in the campsite uh, yeah. in the morning on a river. Uh, that's yeah. that's. Uh, a wonderful time of day and a wonderful time of life. Um, Gary, I really enjoyed this. I thank you so much for um, uh, spending some, some time talking with me. Um, what uh, I want to say to you okay. is reading what you had to say about dry fly fishing in your memoirs. Uh -huh. um, that was a real inspiration for me when I was working on that project because oh, thank you. I, it, it helped me recall why I became a fly fisherman, you know, and, and what I thought I was getting into. And I was exactly right I, about what I was getting into. I didn't have to wear the funny pants that, <laughs> that they all wore and I didn't have to smoke a pipe, you know, <laughs> like, like everybody I thought did. There was a lot of that you know, prior sure. to, Prior yeah, to and, the river and, runs and let's it. face it, we're snobs. So yes, we're snobs, <laughs> and you know I'm I'm part of that as well. So yeah, I knew what I was getting into. <laughs> good, good. Well, um, obviously, I love the sport. I think it's the only way to fly fish. Um, but uh, in my casting lessons, I really emphasize with new, uh, especially beginners. Um, Dry fly fishing seems really complicated, but it pays great dividends. So take it up and try it. <laughs> yeah. Well, you have a great, you've got a couple of trips coming up. Have fun on those. Uh, uh, again, thanks so much for doing this. I think our viewers are going to enjoy this. And uh, um, I'm going to release it both with the video and uh, with the audio. Um, but it's going to have, I'm going to need to do some work on it just to make sure that it's, it's uh, good to go. But, sure, if you want any, if you need any pictures, you just let me know and I'll throw some pictures your way. Oh, thank you. I, I would, I would like a couple of pictures. That would be okay. great. Okay, um, I can do that. 
Uh, and, you know, anyone else that you think would enjoy uh, doing a podcast with me, let them know. Have them contact me. Okay, yeah, I'd be happy to give you a list too. If you if you sent me a note, I could send you back a list with some contacts. It's a deal. Yeah, it's a deal. I got a lot of friends here who who feel like you do. <laughs> They're the best people to know. <laughs> thank you, Gary. All right, thank you, David. Good to talk to you again. Okay. Bye bye. Bye.